So yes, we are live now and I think we can start the session. So uh, welcome back to the uh, second part of the Rupee series uh, that we're hosting at the Fast Food and Cafe Virtual Expo, which is part by ETOS. Uh, we have with us uh, Mihir Mehta, the Senior Vice President of Ashika Capital, uh, to give us an understanding of what is the difference between value and valuation and um, you know, post our previous session that we had on uh, the different uh, critical risk factors that uh, one needs to understand uh, as far as uh, financial and non-financial uh, institutional buyers uh, go. Now, uh, we are looking forward to the session here on value and valuation and over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for joining in. It's it's. I was just telling Mini before we started that uh, it's a little funny to do uh, sessions virtually because you are not able to gather facial cues or how the audience is looking at you. But uh, I think uh, Mini rightly put it that's the world we uh, that's the world we are living in, so can't really complain. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for joining in. And uh, you know, before we start uh, and before I talk about uh, value versus valuation or a little bit more about valuation, because that's one of the things that we as bankers, or at least uh, in my uh, experience, have seen. Um, you know, it, it's always been a debatable question. So before I start, I just wanted to give out a few disclaimers uh, so that you know you know what are you getting into. Uh, please don't drop out at this point in time. These are just simple disclaimers. So uh, the purpose of this uh, session, honestly, is just to give you an overview or some thoughts when you're looking at a valuation or when you're looking at harnessing value for your business. So, you know, when you're raising capital, as we had spoken about the last time, when you're trying to raise capital, one of the critical questions that you need to answer as an entrepreneur is, how much, uh, you know, what, what should be my valuation? What should be the business's valuation as of today? And how do I know it's fair and it's just? Um, so that's, that's something that we are going to touch upon. Uh, another thing is that, uh, as I said, it's a very brief presentation. So I would request everyone to make it more interactive and put in your questions, whatever you might have. I will try and answer it to the best of my abilities. Um, <clears throat> the idea is, uh, the idea is, that we talk about, uh, you know, different aspects of valuation, how we are doing our business uh, while we're conducting a fundraising exercise rather. Uh, the third thing is that I've made use of a lot of pictures in my uh, presentation. I love memes and cartoons, so it's always good. So with that, I would just uh, go ahead and share my screen. Okay, many you may have to give me access to share my screen. Mini, hello. Uh, Mini, can you give me access yeah, to share? Just, screen? just a yeah. second. Yeah, yeah, just a second. Thank you. Okay, I can. Okay, here you go. So value versus valuation. And, um, you know, as the picture very clearly states it, I think uh, valuation is a function of multiple aspects. And when we are talking to entrepreneurs about valuation, they're talking about, you know, how my revenue is, this is my business model, my brand, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, let's try and talk a little bit more about how we think when we look at valuation and, uh, eventual goal if today if you're trying to raise capital and if that's the goal you're trying to achieve and you do need the capital to invest in your business um while valuation will be a critical uh, question it should be a means to the end and i mean you know it should eventually result in some sort of uh, you know possible transaction <clears throat> so as i was mentioning um i'm a big movie fan and i love uh, images so uh, you know, before we start, and Avengers Endgame uh, happens to be my favorite movie as well. So I'm not sure. I'm uh, not sure if you might have seen this, but uh, you know, 
this particular quote and and again uh, please note that i'm not certain if mark cuban has said it but this particular image had been making rounds of uh, you know social media networks for a while uh, which says that 60% of a watermelon is better than 100% of a grape the reason i start with this particular quote is because uh, you know when we are when an entrepreneur is looking at the business and uh, you know they are looking at okay this is what we've created and this is what there i mean you know there is a potential to create more but a lot of times uh, you know the stake that you hold in your business is critical and yes it should be but that becomes a moot point and you know eventually unable to progress uh, when it comes to raising capital and that's where i think this kind of sets the tonality for this uh, brief session wherein um, you know obviously if you own 60% of a watermelon um, owning 100% of grape is obviously less valuable than owning 60% of a watermelon uh, obviously no guesses but uh, no prices for the guesses but the next quote which also says business happens over years and years value is measured by total upside of the business and not by how much you squeezed out in one day this is extremely critical for you to know and this obviously again um, as per the internet has been said by mark cuban but the reason this is important is because a lot of times um, as business owners or as entrepreneurs we are looking at what am i getting out of this deal or what am i getting out of this capital raise uh, without and you know in those times um, the larger picture takes a uh, back side or larger picture doesn't come up and hence it's important that you focus on what the big picture is as well uh, i'm not sure if the nation wants to know but i'm sure founders uh, ask for questions like if it's my first fundraise how much stake should we dilute um what should be the ideal valuation for my business if the valuation assigned to my company is not desirable should i not raise capital again going back to my first statement which I, wherein i mentioned that valuation or dilution of equity is a consequence of your business plans right so today the eventual question is do you need the money and if you are wanting that capital obviously you have to give in some equity uh it should not in ideal in an ideal scenario and or in an utopian world it should not become a detriment to raising capital because eventually the idea is that you invest that capital and harness the value of the business as you move forward so you know when i was type when i was mentioning um, to many that i would like to talk about valuations and value and you know value versus valuation to be honest with you obviously uh, there's not uh, i mean you know there's no significant difference between what value is and valuation is more like a process but the reason i called it value versus valuation is because you know the idea was to uh, give you certain thoughts or share certain thoughts wherein you are able to think about value more than just the process so it is about reaching uh, that particular value that the business holds and not really just you know worrying about the process as to how are you reaching that <coughs> so the reason valuation is extremely critical and uh, should be also and uh, for a for a few seconds please ignore that uh, interesting poster which may Uh, give you a lot of brain waves uh i will come back to that uh but you know one of the reasons uh, valuation is extremely critical is because that allows you to figure out what's the kind of stake that you should dilute and especially when we talk of companies trying to raise capital for the first time um it's a debatable question because <clears throat> when you're raising capital for the first time obviously there are considerations like uh what if the business is not pan out as we envisioned or uh am i am i not getting the value because i'm too young as a company or too young as a business um should i dilute you know x y z percentage stake and so on and so forth when you're thinking of these uh, aspects as an entrepreneur and this um, i'm assuming because the audience is more uh, you know founders and entrepreneurs who joined in uh it is critical that you uh take certain factors into consideration when you are thinking of stake dilution so stake dilution obviously is a function of what kind of valuation are you receiving or what kind of value are you receiving for your business but you know 
multiple times we've seen entrepreneurs and we've seen uh, businesses give away a large chunk of equity in the you know initial rounds they were leading to a state where you know you have certain requirements in the future but because of the position that you've put yourself in uh, you do not have enough hedge to dilute further equity and so on and so forth um, the idea here is to avoid you know making deals or conducting transactions or raising capital in a fashion which eventually jeopardizes your future trajectory and hence it is extremely important that when you're trying to raise capital and this is a common thing that i do ask entrepreneurs and they always tell me that okay look i'm going to raise this x y z whatever like you know x crores today or x million dollars today and uh, you know this is how my business will pan out in the next few years and the next question that i ask them is uh, so when do you plan to raise you know capital the next time and uh, they're like uh, maybe once we run out of capital right now and that's a very obvious answer obviously but it's important to plot it out it's important that you understand uh, what your future company trajectory is and what kind of further capital will you require and, and in what timelines that allows you to fathom that okay these are the possible valuation scenarios uh, which is the next point if i'm going to conduct my next round raise or if i'm going to you know raise capital say in a couple of years <coughs> uh so sorry i just got distracted with the message uh it was to maximize the screen i think this is the one okay i hope this is that was visible so yeah so the idea here was that um how do you think about uh, you know raising capital so when you're plotting this future trajectory and when you're plotting as to when will you require capital next what you're actually doing is that you are figuring out in two years from now if i'm going to raise capital and if i'm at this particular scale <clears throat> or some other scale as we discussed in the last session you always uh, you know conduct multiple scenarios it's not always going to be that your business performs as you planned it to perform so if it if there's a pessimistic scenario or an optimistic scenario how will my valuation turn out to be and if at that point in time i'm you know i'm supposed to raise another xyz uh, you know million dollars what is the kind of stake i may dilute and that gives you a certain understanding in terms of how the trajectory will be because your business and your fundraise please note this your business and your fundraise will not end with the first fundraise that you do the another another critical point uh, or crucial factor to consider is requirement of minimum capital this is important because you know a lot of times when founders are raising capital obviously um, <clears throat> the idea is that we raise capital so that we are able to grow faster and we able to scale and so on so forth build that build that uh, uh, you know business out however at least in your initial you know phases of raising capital or even i would i would say even if you've raised capital earlier it's important to know that from an operational standpoint what's the minimum capital required uh, so as to ensure that you are able to either justify your infrastructure or justify your team strength or whatever uh, you know that resource is <clears throat> and that kind of gives you your threshold that uh, if in a case where your the valuation or the value given to you is not uh, desirable is there a possibility to control stake dilution by reducing the amount of capital that i require and obviously the last question is or the last factor is how can you build value with the capital and adoption of measures in order to build an efficient cap capital mix so obviously a lot of times uh, we also you know encounter Uh, situations where entrepreneurs tell us that uh, you know we need this kind of capital because this is critical for the business to at least uh, build that product or build that distribution or at least uh, go to market in a particular city geography however it is whatever your objective is um again from a stake dilution perspective and in order to ensure that stake dilution is limited uh, whereby you know you have enough equity uh, at your disposal when you're raising capital further you can look at different source of finance, sources of financing as well um, if there's a possibility so we have in the past obviously recommended that you can look at debt capital or you could look at some sort of you know 
um, bridge capital or some sort of, again, source of financing, which is not exactly leading to dilution of stake. Now, I'm not too sure if there are investors or if there are potential um, investors in, on the, in the audience, but uh, the reason I put that special 26 uh, poster up is because, um, again, I think uh, this is where my, uh, a little bit of my CA knowledge kicks in. But, um, you know, one of the things is that under Companies Act, uh, and, and this is something that we do tell entrepreneurs just so that they understand uh, the, the picture and, I mean, you know, so, so they know all the aspects that let me put it that way, is that um, for certain matters like alteration of articles, alteration of memorandum, issuance of shares, um, you know, uh, appointment of auditors, there are special resolutions required under the Companies Act. Now, special resolution is generally when you have received 75% uh, vote from the shareholders in the AGM. And hence, what we say is that uh, today is the shareholding is split in a way where you own less than 75%, um, so say 74 and hence 26. So if there is some, if there's an investor or there's another stakeholder who owns more than 26%, so their say in terms of the special resolution becomes important. And obviously, um, you know, from a voting perspective, um, it may so happen that if you're trying to clear a special resolution, it may, I mean, you know, not go through or go through, however it is. But this is something where, again, something that you should know, it's more like a, a, a piece of information that needs to be known to founders when they're using capital. Demystifying valuation. Value of a business is matter of perception. So yes, I mean, I think, every transaction that I've possibly looked at in my uh, career or uh, transactions that I've looked at any, any ways, um, you know, the, the debatable point or the point where, um, you know, discussions happen is value because again, it's a perception. So if I look at, if there's a transaction where there are three stakeholders, which is the founder, the advisors and, you know, the investor, there are, there are definitely going to be three different points of uh, perception and the way they look at a particular business. Hence, it is rightly said that it's an art and not a science. But, you know, when you're trying to, and again, you may get expert help in terms of, you know, sorry, conduct of valuation. But as an entrepreneur, some of the things that you should definitely know or you should definitely think about are first and foremost, uh, you know, obviously when you're trying to value a firm, you're trying to understand what is the value that this business can generate over a period of time. And hence you're raising that capital and hence you're gonna deploy it and harness that value. So constructing that business model, uh, this is very critical. And, you know, again, when you're trying to plot numbers and please, we don't, please don't be afraid of numbers. Um, which is again a concern that we see, but when you're trying to plot numbers or when you're at least trying to plot your business out on a paper, more often than not, we see that it's, um, you know, the way it's projected or the way people talk about businesses, it can be a, it can either be a top down or a bottom up approach. What we mean by this is that either you're going by the victim that here's my addressable market and here's how I'm going to capture a particular share of the market. And that's more like a top down approach so that you are determining how your business will, you know, uh, turn out in terms of revenues and in terms of other financial, or else you're like, okay, this is what I've done in the past and this is how I can grow. Uh, so these are my numbers. And I know that I can grow say 40, 50, 60, 70% or however it is, because I'll be raising capital and I'll be growing faster than the industry. Whatever approach you uh, take or you undertake, please ensure that you're able to justify um, to your, so forget the invest I mean, you should be able to justify it to yourself. There are times when we encounter business models where people talk about, you know, very interesting growth rates. And when we, you know, break it down, um, you know, the arithmetic doesn't, uh, you know, work out properly. So it's important that you are um, thorough with what kind of approach are you adopting and you can justify it. 
I think something that we discussed the last time as well, building in sensitivity in different scenarios in the business as an investor would do. This is again pretty critical because you know we as founders may think that okay, this is how the business is going to pan out, but eventually there may be different scenarios that the business may pan out. Like today, if I'm thinking okay, my business will do X amount of revenue, it may not be able to do X. It may be at X minus or X minus minus or even X plus. It's important that you take that sensitivity into account and you value the business in different scenarios because that's what ideally would be uh, the exit point of valuation for an investor. <clears throat> Deriving fair valuation and adopting benchmarking mechanism. Yes, so this is again um, quite critical because you know when you're valuing. So today, no business or no entrepreneur uh, exists in isolation. Maybe a long term to use, but uh, right now, but um, you know, there are either businesses that are constructed in a similar fashion or in similar industry X Y Z, which obviously we call the bears. It's crucial that when you're trying to value your business, your brand, and again, your business may be a function of your brand, um, that you are adopting benchmarking mechanisms, so you are understanding how. Say if there are certain transactions that have happened in the past, how have they taken place, and what kind of you know valuations have they received? Because that gives you a fair bit of range and indication that this is how industry you know. So today, if I'm a consumer business, say in fashion, um, it would do good to me to see how other businesses in the same domain have been valued because. That gives me a certain landscape. That gives me certain understanding of how third parties are viewing this industry. <clears throat> and obviously, I may be an outcast uh, and get a better valuation, or unfortunately, you know, worse valuation. But having that sense of the landscape you are dealing with is extremely critical. Again, when it comes to I think consumer businesses, and because um, you know. We work with a few of them. One of the com I wouldn't say complaints, sorry, concerns uh, has been that you know the valuation does not fairly account for the brand equity that we have built. <clears throat> this is something that um, we encounter as a question, or I'm sure uh, you know founders also question themselves that look, I have built a solid brand. There are people talking about this brand uh, across the country or across different uh, geographies and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of um, you know buzz I have built about this brand, but uh, does my valuation so today if I'm getting an X value and whatever I'm assessed at, does it take into account the uh, this brand equity? Well, see, this is a you know again this is a subjective uh, question or rather uh, the lens to look at it is first and foremost what you should what a what a founder should look at is that how does this brand equity help you score brownie points. Now, it can be in terms of garnering better demand. It can be in terms of garnering better realization, you know, from the same target segment where your peers are playing in. Or it can be, you know, in terms of cost structures. So however and whatever, like today, uh, we've seen businesses where even in F&B and without naming anybody, uh, there are certain brands in F&B who have better you know, in the same space, have better marketing to sales ratio. So what it means is that for every buck spent on marketing, they derive better realization in terms of revenue. Because their brand equity is high. So those are aspects that you need to define first, exactly what does your brand bring in for you. Um, once you have defined that, maybe you can again, as I said, it is subjective as to what should be exactly the value of that equity, uh, because today, uh, let me just give you a very simple example. If you're covered by, say, 20 newspapers uh, for a brand launch that you've done, or, or there's a lot of buzz, now how do you convert into revenue? And what is it that exactly this, this brand equity brings to you? Once you figure that out, I think accounting for that, again, there are various methods. I'm not going um, into those methods, but <clears throat> there has to be a way uh, to account for that additional or better than industry or better than peer, uh, you know, uh, attribute, wherein 
that brand equity factor comes in. So before you like you know conclude that the valuation does not take the brand equity into account, it's important to understand what does this brand bring to you. Again, uh, excuse me for the cartoons, but I love them. There's a famous saying which says there's no smoke without fire and uh, absolutely true. But similarly, there is another saying that there's no rewards without risks. Uh, I think there's an important point that I want to communicate to founders that you know, when an investor and when you're in a possible fundraise scenario, any investor is obviously partaking in the possibility to generate rewards, but uh, as much as the entrepreneur does, he's also he or she is also bearing the risk of that business. Um, there are times where you know when we again speak to founders, um, we realize that businesses obviously are meant to be run in order to reward you, in order to reward your stakeholders and everyone. However, um, when you know investors are entering a business or when someone is providing financial capital, which is also a form of capital, while the entrepreneurs bring in the uh, you know business acumen, the human capital, and like you know they run the show. Financial capital is an important ingredient in ensuring success in the business. So they are assuming certain risks, and that risk is losing that capital, and there's an opportunity cost attached to that capital. <clears throat> so what we should obviously as as founders, um, and you know even obviously investors do understand it, but I think it's important to factor in risk scenarios in the business when you are, you know, thinking about how is your business valued. Um, you know, as it's, it, everyone wants to look at a look at a rosy picture, and you know, there's no denying that. But uh, but you can't leave out the risks, and those risk factors need to be equally given importance and valued when you're determining the value of the entire business. Well, these are not technical jargons. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're thinking that, please you don't think that. These are very simple uh, jargons going from WIIFM to WIIFU. Um, as I said, because this is not a physical session, if it was, I would have asked someone to help me with this, but uh, let me give it to you. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that we have to, again, from an entrepreneur's perspective, it has to go from what's in it from, for me to what's in it for us. When I talk of what's in it for us, it simply says uh, that in 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 a case where you're trying to conduct a transaction, again, from my experience, I can tell you that there are uh, entrepreneurs who said, if I give uh, my business for this value, then maybe it's not justified to what effort we've put in. Mm, the concerns are like, okay, you know, I have given so much time and effort to this business and how can I just give it to someone who has, uh, who just comes in and has uh, not really given that kind of uh, effort into the business. But look, today, um, obviously when an investor or anyone who's coming into the business, uh, they are, as I, as I said in the previous slide, they're assuming certain risks. Now, Yes, it is important to think what's in it for you, but it's also important to think where will this capital lead you to and how you as a founder or how the entrepreneur along with other stakeholders will be able to create value in the long run. In that case, uh, there are some critical questions to consider. I think the first and foremost, and uh, you know, I had mentioned it in my last session as well, and I would again reiterate, is that what could be a realistic valuation of the business at the time of potential exit? And this is critical because that kind of determines what kind of entry point should be legitimate or should be ideally viable at this point in time. Uh, if as a founder, you're not thinking about how your business will pan out and what would be a potential valuation. I mean, again, you have to think of how realistic it is, can be, it's very difficult to really debate on what the entry point should be. And once you kind of plot that out, you yourself uh, get a sense as to how the, you know, how the return profile or how this entire journey will be. What would the business trajectory be and value be if I do not invest capital? This is one, another thing that uh, I would definitely, and I mean, I would strongly recommend is that 
you should also look at how your business will pan out if this capital was not invested and try and plot it out for say the next uh, five years or three years like for the whatever period you were going to use that capital for <clears throat> if the value if you do not really see a value enhancement uh that is that comes in as a result of raising this capital then well i mean maybe uh there's no point of raising this capital but if there is a significant value enhancement that you see in terms of business in terms of your own stake um obviously then raising capital is warranted so it's important uh, that you do not just think about okay if i were to um you know raise this capital give this much stake what would happen and so on and so forth but also think on the flip side that if you weren't going to do this what would happen will the potential exit reward the <clears throat> exit reward the investors and myself for the risks i'm taking this is again extremely critical you are going to obviously as a founder you know a founder puts in hard work effort and obviously there's an opportunity cost attached to the time invested in the business uh and that's from from an entrepreneur's perspective but from an investor's perspective as well there's an opportunity cost the capital that he's you know invest he she's invested in the business now when we talk of that it's important and again uh going back to my previous slides and my previous uh, talk last thursday <clears throat> it's important to plot this return profile out once you do that you kind of understand that okay if like for instance if the return profile is not extremely attractive now there are two options one is that again i'm not asking you to design numbers like a magician but from a realistic perspective one is that has like you know have i have i captured all the scenarios and is this the best that the business can deliver <clears throat> then in order to make it attractive sorry then in order to make it attractive um should the entry point be different for the investor and then it makes enough sense for the investor to get into the business so hence uh, you know it's important that you plot this entire journey and also figure out what kind of return profile are you offering to the investor which is the next point <coughs> as, as i said there's an opportunity cost to the capital attached so today if an investor is investing 100 bucks in a business which could be invested in some other asset class there would be some sort of a return profile now you know you all obviously if i am taking this risk of um, you know a uh, kind of an unlimited downside so if it's an equity investment it's it's almost an unlimited downside right uh, if i am taking that kind of risk uh, am i being rewarded and is the return profile attractive when i look at less risky asset classes where my capital or my capital may be protected and there is limited downside and so on and so forth obviously how will this capital rate help me enhance value of my business over time back to my first slide larger point uh, larger picture sorry eventually value building is a process in time so it's not about just one transaction it's not just about one year of operation it's not just about you know one at a particular moment you're going to build it over time so if this capital helps you build that then obviously it makes sense if it doesn't and this as i said is there's no significant uh, increase or there's no significant value enhancement um maybe then you may have to rethink and uh, revisit why you are raising capital and what are the you know reasons you are doing this i think the last point because it's in bold and i have intentionally kept it so is that what are the other benefits that will ensue to the business as a result of this capital raise and as a, as a result of the incoming investor i think and this is what we define as intangible benefits i'm sure a lot of times investors speak about this uh there are a lot of intangible benefits that accrue uh in addition to financial capital that is provided by <clears throat> a potential investor so you know sometimes and i i do tell entrepreneurs that as you may be thinking of uh you know certain intangibles that you bring as a business because as i was telling you about brand equity now today um you know as i said it's very difficult to give a particular number to the kind of you know traction my brand has built similarly from an investor's perspective uh, there are other things that they bring to the business maybe it's uh, strategic direction or insight um help with management bandwidth and etc 
how do you so as an entrepreneur you should always look at those things as well when you are you know debating the valuation when you're thinking about the valuation because again from you know the other side of the table that's something that has not that may not have been captured in the valuation of the business because that will unravel or that will be seen only once you know that comes in so today um if as an investor for instance i mentioned to you and and i think same goes for both sides i mean if as an investor i mention that um, you know this is what this is an area i would help you with it will only you know uh, get reveal or it will only become clearer once an investment have, has happened and once you know i am in the business similarly if i feel the brand is extremely strong today and there is uh, you know enough certainty that i would be able to convert this brand equity to sales again that will only be known once that business you know starts investing capital and you know it it gets onto that trajectory so these are intangibles that need to be thought of and also given some um, you know at some some significant value uh, when when any transaction is ensuing so i think this is my last slide and um, you know as i mentioned finance folks i am not too sure if that's the right term but um, you know this is a this is a term that is uh, the that sorry this is a quote and obviously i'm sure you might have heard of warren buffett but this is a quote that has been said umpteen number of times i think um, i've heard it multiple times been quoted by people across the globe but this is critical and this is really true uh, today you know how investors think of a business or and and that's where i would recommend that entrepreneurs also think like investors at least when they're fundraising is that uh, if i'm going to pay a certain price for this business what is it that i'm going to make uh as you know because of once i'm paying this price of, of the cost i have a lot of risk i have a downside so today like you know and in our jargon we call it intrinsic value what i mean by that is that today i may be paying say x uh, you know 100 bucks for something but if there is a lot of economic benefit attached to it maybe in the years to come i may be able to harness value which is worth 300 now that's where you know i'm paying a price to harness that value um so price and again the reason i put this out is uh, to be honest because we do get um, you know uh, questions or concerns or thoughts that oh is my business uh, worth this only or is my business not worth you know much more 100% more 200% more and that's what i'm just putting it out there's a difference between what is price and what is value so today yes it's not the value of your business it's the price i'm going to spend to harness a certain value the more the value of your business actually may be 200% more which will manifest over time so there's a difference so you know when you equate these two you may end up you know either disrupting the exercise or um not i mean you know uh, conducting uh not not the best deals so it's important that you uh, keep this in mind and i think this is my favorite uh, uh picture and i hence i keep it but i think yeah, that's that's about it uh, uh back back to you mini thanks so much uh, meher that was uh, very interesting i must say and uh, it gave us a good a, a, basic understanding of what uh, value and valuation is i i have a question for you now you talked about the top down and the bottom up uh, business models right now mm-hmm. is there anything specific industry wise when you talk about a specific industry is there would you say that a certain type of model is what one should follow in a particular industry is there anything like that uh so at least you know so for most of the industries like i would uh, tell you many is uh, we do uh, suggest a top down model uh, essentially because like for instance if i'm a consumer brand i'm starting a business in uh, you know consumer packaged goods um not today if it's a new category it may be difficult to understand what my addressable market is uh, and you know i can take a certain universe to be my market but uh, you know what happens is that 
when I kind of understand that this is the kind of market share I want to occupy and then these are the requirements that I need to invest in order to get that kind of market share, you are, what you're essentially doing is you're capturing a certain market growth and you're capturing a certain market share. So for more often than not, if it is a possibility, uh, then we do recommend that, uh, you know, you go by that approach. However, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you may come across products or services which may not find a parallel, uh, right? So it may be a actual disruption. So as we were talking previously, just, just giving an example, um, when I look at plant-based foods as a category today, now it's a new category, it's emerging. So uh, it's kind of difficult to say that there is a certain market which already understands that product and buys that product and so on and so forth. So now if I'm a company which is manufacturing uh, plant-based, um, can be anything, any product, um, I may see exponential growth uh, you know, once I've invested capital because it's difficult to fathom uh, exactly what my addressable market is. Maybe 10 years from now, it will be easier and there will be something else. So where there is some, right. like, you know, complete uh, ambiguity in terms of creating a parallel, yes, you can go by certain, you know, understanding of how you've seen your business grow or how you've seen in the past customers coming in, repeats and so on and so forth, and then project your business accordingly. But if it's, if it's a particular space where you can draw a parallel, um, going by that top-down kind of a thought process uh, really helps you also to keep a track on how am I progressing as a business. Right. So in the going by the same thing, if there if it's if you're a disruptor in the market or if you're doing something which is completely out of uh, what uh, out of the ordinary, uh, if I can say you talked about benchmarking for the valuation. So mm. that also, I guess, would not really be possible. Right. Yes. So that becomes a difficulty. See, um, obviously, uh, you know, especially when it comes to disruptions, because there is no price discovery platform today or. Uh, it's difficult to put a price to like, uh, you know, we've seen businesses which are doing something completely uh, different and something that has not been. Um, so, so let's look at Tesla, for instance, uh, right? So when Tesla came out with electric cars, it was a disruption, it was one of the biggest disruptions this brand right. has ever seen. Um, now at that point in time, it's difficult to say what Tesla should be valued at, yes. Um, but in those cases, I think, you know, the idea that an entrepreneur in my in my personal opinion should have is that when it's a disruption it's need, it needs that validation it needs number it needs uh, you know to become a business uh, so a lot of times we see innovations not really becoming businesses uh, so for for that point in time i think valuation uh, what takes precedence over valuation should be the validation of the uh, you know product or the innovation right. or the disruption Today, what we see Tesla and what Tesla's value is, I think 15 years back, no one would have imagined or whatever time we get back, no one would have imagined Tesla would become this. Uh, but it has discovered value in a certain manner. At that right. back in the day, I think what was important for Tesla to prove is that this can work. And they proved the they proved, uh, you know, sorry, they proved it. Uh, and that's important, I think. Uh, so, right. so yes, it may become difficult, but I think overall idea should be to prove validation first right right now i would like to take a look at uh, we've got a couple of questions here and in fact it's related to what you were also talking about uh, you know uh, the tangible or the intangible uh, aspects that one should look at so we have a question that says has the way business is valued changed keeping in mind today's scenario so i think the intangibles especially in today's scenario becomes uh, all the more yeah important. all the more important am i right in saying that yeah 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 absolutely i think um so i would take two perspectives i think from a founder's perspective yes uh when the founders today looking at valuations the perspective changes that uh yes they require more intangibles and they require to understand See, a lot of businesses went through a phase where, you know, capital was in, you know, scarce supply. Um, there were blockages to businesses and they've gone through a certain challenging phase. So in these phases is where you test the other, you know, intangibles that an investor brings in, like uh, the, the willingness to support the business, the uh, thing to ensure that business still comes out of where it is. And 
we can still survive and so on and so forth. So I think today founders are definitely looking at more intangibles and not just that, okay, this is the capital coming in, this is the valuation I'm getting and you know, that's it. Um, so they, they want to understand what kind of strategic, uh, you know, benefits can an investor bring in, um, you know, what is the long-term vision of the investor himself so that they are aligned or not aligned and things like that. So it's not just about, uh, you know, capital, but it's, a, it's that entire alignment. And from an investor's perspective, I think um, what has happened is, is that there's been a complete change in terms of, you know, obviously uh, there's, you know, the, the, the propensity to build risk into the pricing. So hence we've been seeing valuations take a massive hit uh, across the board, I think across sectors is because, um, you know, factoring in that risk in the entry point itself so that you kind of protect your downside going forward um, has has definitely been on the high. Uh, so investors do want to protect uh, their downside. And you know, as I, as I was mentioning in the presentation, it can happen in one of two ways that one, your entry point is attractive. So the price I'm entering in is good enough for me to protect that downside. And I think the second is, okay, if, you know, uh, should I should I reduce my exposure to the business? So if an investor may be looking at say investing X, should I not start with X, but should I start with X minus minus and then you know uh, notch it up? So yes, uh, the idea of uh, valuing risk factors is actually uh, higher is what we are seeing, and they want to ensure that most of the risk factors are built in while when they are entering the business. Yeah, so I, I think related to that is a question specifically talking about uh, the f and industry is that in that case, when investors are, uh, there is a little bit of hesitation from their side. So would that mean restaurants without a strong delivery revenue uh, at this point of time, change the dynamic, dynamic of the valuation, even if the brand has considerable value? Yes, uh, I would say yes. Uh, I mean, it, it may sound like an aberration. Obviously, um, see today, uh, the hard truth is that delivery is an important, or I think it's a, it's, it's a critical element in the food and beverage industry. Um, you just can't escape it. Uh, so whether or not, whether you choose a Swiggy or some other platform, that's a different question. But escaping that uh, trend that has come in or certain trends that have come in is difficult. Now, obviously, uh, you know, today there is a lot of ambiguity and specifically to SNB, I think there's a lot of ambiguity as to how will the next, you know, few quarters be. Um, and I think, so there are now two ways an investor would look at it. One is that, okay, look, let the tide pass or let the storm be over, we'll, we'll think about it then. So let these, you know, few quarters pass and, you know, now the business may survive that time, may not survive that time, not too sure. But that is one way an investor may look at it. And the second is that, look, we understand that this next few quarters are going to be difficult for the restaurant industry, essentially because, you know, not certain if the consumer confidence is back, not certain if, you know, uh, people are going to replace eating in their houses and going out frequently not certain as to how workplaces will be, you know, in the next few quarters, because as you understand, a lot of, lot of actually, you know, food places, restaurants run on professionals and, you know, so, so a segment has actually gone out. So they may be like, okay, look, you know, we don't know how the six quarters or seven, how many quarters are going to be. So let us build that into the price we're entering at, or, you know, we don't invest at all. We just keep the exposure zero. And once this, Storm is over, then let's look at it. In either case, um, yes, that hit will be there. Uh, and that's why I think delivery is critical. And just uh, as, as I mentioned, it will impact your valuations uh, if it's just one channel kind of a thing. Right, right. No, it is a fact that uh, unfortunately the FNB industry has been hit very badly, but uh, we are seeing, we are, I mean, I would want to end this on a, a negative note. <laughs> we would definitely, we are seeing things uh, getting a little better, people opening up, res restaurants opening yeah. up, people being more open to uh, going back to restaurants. So uh, let us hope that, you know, things can come back to uh, the normal, I would say, and uh, uh, become good again for all of us.
who are part of oh, this absolutely. industry. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so thank you so much, Mihir, for your time and uh, your insights. I'm sure this would uh, make a lot of difference to the people who are actually looking at this point of time to, uh, you know, approach investors or anything and to get an idea of what their businesses are like uh, in terms of value and valuation. And uh, uh, thank you for your time. We look forward to having you on our physical show when we come back uh, to oh, absolutely. You know, uh, I think that, getting that will be a delight doing events the way we know it. <laughs> yeah, no, that will yeah. be a delight for thank sure. Thank you. Thanks again. So thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.